Welcome. Thank you for joining us on today's webinar hosted by the National Center for Pyramid Model Innovations. My name is Victor Trinidad with NCPMI. This webinar is part of the Within the Framework webinar series. The topic for today is Help and Hope, Combining PBS and Optimism Training for Families of Young Children with Challenging Behavior, presented by Shelley Clark and Lisa Fox. Thank you very much. Please proceed. Thanks, Victor. So Lisa, I'm Lisa Fox with the National Center for Pyramid Model Innovations. We're so glad to have you here to join us. And really, I'm not going to present much because I have Shelly Clark here. And um, I'm just so excited for you to get exposed to this content. I've known Shelly forever, it feels like. And anything I know about behavior intervention, I learned um, with Shelly. Um, who is probably the most skilled person I know about developing behavior support plans in a way that's family-centered and in the use of positive behavior support. So she, this is really a treat. And what's so exciting is this innovation of combining optimism and understanding optimism as we work with families around behavior. So I will shut up because she's got a lot to share with us. Remember that you can pose questions, and this is really an opportunity. Uh, although you know the rules, you can't say I have a child with, because what she's gonna say to you is, what do you think the function of that behavior is? But I know you're gonna wanna ask questions about the application. So please put that in the Q&A chat, and we'll save a little bit of time at the end so that Shelly can um, respond to some of those questions. So Shelly, take it away. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks for such a nice introduction. And, and Victor, thanks for all your help and technical support. I um, appreciate everyone attending the webinar this afternoon. Um, my primary role is as a PBS coach facilitator, and I work with families and collaborative teams to address severe challenging behavior that's exhibited by young children in home, school, and community settings. So I'm really excited to be able to share this description of procedures and outcomes of um, behavioral parent training research study that I was involved with. Um, we identified it as the positive family intervention study, and we looked at the not only developing but delivering two different types of behavior parent training for parents of young children and challenging behavior who also had an identified cognitive or developmental delay. All right. Um, let me go back here. Okay, so I, I was um, sharing with folks our um, positive family intervention study and um, really excited because we were looking at the best way to provide behavioral parent training to families of young children with challenging behavior and identified um, disabilities. And so what we really wanted to focus on was looking at if there was a way we could tweak or revise our standardized behavior, um, positive behavior support parent training in order to help to uh, assess and um, maybe a, a better content to um, evaluate if child outcomes and level of implement implementation fidelity would improve with an additional training component that comprised of techniques associated with cognitive behavior therapy, or what we commonly refer to as optimistic parenting or optimism training. So this just kind of lays out the two different groups that we really focused on. Um, one group of families uh, received what we called the HELP behavior parent training, and that really focused on teaching families the tools of PBS, the process of completing a functional behavioral assessment in a collaborative environment with a PBS coach, and to be able to implement behavioral intervention strategies that were function-based within a package intervention. So we looked at helping families develop and implement prevention strategies, teaching strategies, and um, changing responses in terms of appropriate and inappropriate behavior. The um, second group that we looked at, and this is where we really develop an entirely new training, and that's what I'm going to focus on today, is what we call HOPE. And this um, condition was the delivery, again, 
The second group of families also received the PBS training, but in addition, we embedded those techniques of optimistic um, parenting or cognitive behavior therapy in an effort to really see if we could enhance um, not just implementation, but also parent confidence, build greater self-awareness, and gratitude of daily events, which has all been identified with um, improvements and uh, increased success rates for parent engagement and implementation. So for the benefit of time in this webinar, I'm really going to focus on sharing those behavioral parent training procedures and techniques that we use for that HOPE um, behavior parent training. And um, from here, what I'll do is I'm going to just kind of lay out the rationale behind why we chose this additional component. And then we'll look at how we teach the skills of optimism training with um, video clips that actually depict each step of the training with actual families that were involved in our project. So just wanted to take a second to acknowledge our research team, um, particularly our principal investigator, Dr. Mark Duran, and our uh, project director, Dr. Mimi Heineman, as well as my fellow coaches, Christine Christodoulou, uh, Laura Casper, Melissa Zona. And um, just to let you know, this took place over a five-year period, and it was conducted both at um, SUNY in New York, Albany, and then at USF St. Petersburg. So I um, wanted to give a little bit of background about why we were trying to focus on improving our behavior parent training to address um, the abilities of families and to encourage and promote successful outcomes. We really wanted to learn about how we could effectively support parents to fully collaborate and implement those PBS strategies that they had selected and that they wanted to have work for their child to improve daily routines that were associated with challenging behavior, as well as family quality of life. And we knew that there were there were barriers that impacted the ability for some parents to not only complete training, but also effectively use these behavior supports. The problem was we weren't really sure what they were and how could we revise our content in our behavior parent training to address those needs and barriers that some families were experiencing. So our first goal was to identify those factors and figure out how we could adjust what we're sharing and supporting for parents. And then if we could identify and gain information about those barriers to participation and implementation, then as researchers and practitioners, we could really focus on the best way to address the delivery of those behavior parent training content for those in, improved outcomes. And I think what we did as a group was we started with, well, we know PBS is really effective. It's evidence-based, it's been around for decades. Um, and we also know some fundamental concepts about young children and families that are experiencing challenging behavior and complex impairments. Um, first of all, we know that kids with complex disabilities can learn and be successful and that the type and severity of behavior issues may look different across kids or occur during different situations, but the bottom line is that behavior is purposeful and it's communicative. And for young kids identified with autism, ASD, and other types of developmental disabilities, we also know that problem behavior is common. It's estimated that 15% of children in this population will engage in severe problem behavior. And we also know from the literature that when kids engage in challenging behavior, parents are likely to report much more stress and even mental health concerns. This aspect of the impact of stressors for this particular segment of parents has really been somewhat ignored by the literature until recently. But what we do know is that in fact, the level of stress experienced by this group of families with young children and challenging behavior is comparable to the level of stress experienced by military veterans who have been diagnosed with PTSD. So this is really an implication that we need to think about for families who are experiencing those stressors 
and, and thinking about how much does that limit their success? And can we do something to support and promote uh, more effective interventions, uh, better quality of life and good child outcomes? All right, so we now we know those concepts, right? We're all familiar with that. We've all experienced that as practitioners of being able to help families and all these complex stressors that they're enduring. But what do we still need to learn, right? The reason are factors that are associated with family failure, you know, it's kind of up in the air. Yeah, we call them stressors, but how much of an impact do they have as a barrier, right? Because we have to think about it. There may be attrition in family engagement where we may not see good implementation, but initially we got in contact with those families because they reached out for help, right? So we need to figure out how to best address those barriers to engagement and implementation. And then how do we take that information from what we identify and adapt our collaborative approach to better meet the needs of families? And that really, really comes back to us, right? As practitioners, we need to know how we change what we deliver, how we deliver it, and improve our tools in our own toolbox. So thinking about that question, that was lingering for our group too before we started this, is how do we increase our ability to support families, right? We do, and we've all seen it, have highly motivated families who may very need a very short period of collaboration and training and then run with intervention strategies and they understand function and they're be able to implement. You know, they may have the best of circumstances in terms of buy-in, um, some good resources, um, a good support system. But even with those kind of controlled situations, what we've seen is that optimum outcomes for families are only experienced by 30% of those that use behavior support strategies. So we really need, again, to acknowledge that we have to enhance our knowledge and skills. We have to really, really think about that. And then we really need to think about the responsibility of the families, right? When they're not having that success or when they're failing to implement to fidelity, um, we need to consider that the responsibility of that should not be placed on them. We need a mirror to look at ourselves. I say this because I think about a situation, it was about 15 years ago and I was working in a project, it was, um, where we really, uh, we work with the same um, types of groups of families and we provided uh, behavioral parent training one week on at a centralized location. And then the alternate weeks, we'd actually go out to the home and coach during those target routines they identified as tough. And what we saw was the first week we had 12 families participate. By the third week, it was six families. And then it went down to four. And thinking about it, we had all these cool things that we thought would be beneficial and help them to um, participate. We had free food, we had respite, we provided transportation, but still we saw that loss of engagement, right? And so I kind of cringe because back in the day, my excuse for that is, mm, you know, they're having a rough time and they're just not ready. So I was dismissing it. So. You know, I think we really need to take that step back and take responsibility as practitioners that we do need to figure out how else we can help them with fidelity. We do need to help them stay engaged and give them those opportunities to participate. And again, looking at our toolbox. And then as I shared from my own experience, we need to reflect on our own perceptions, not just the families. So I really wanted to get that point across before we go any further, but those questions and concerns really led us to focus on how we can improve our support uh, using um, behavioral parent training for families. So one often acknowledged but under investigated type of barrier that's really coming to light recently is the influence of parent attributional style. So this is the attitude or perceptions that not just parents, but everyone, um, but for our situation that parents bring 
to events and day-to-day -day activities. And there's really an increasing recognition that this may significantly contribute to the success or failure of parents being able to use strategies that they were involved in developing and also being able to maintain engagement and being able to hang in there, right? So at the core of that is parents' perceptions about efficacy. And that really reflects how parents view themselves and their child. So for self-efficacy, that's the parent's perception of their own ability to be able to change their child's behavior. And then child efficacy is the parent's perception of what they think the child's ability is to change. So negative perceptions regarding efficacy is often associated with what we call commonly pessimism, but it's really that negative internal self-talk. This type of belief system and style um, may really influence and impede the parent's ability to, imp to make choices for their child and take action for themselves to advocate for their child. So that could be implementing interventions. It could be choosing a form of um, treatment. It could be um, resisting placing demands on their children for fear of escalating problem behavior. They may perceive that as parents, they, could, they can't do very much to make a difference. And as a result, they give up and give in. And that may be related to fidelity, right? And it also may be related that they have a lack of confidence in themselves or that their child who has this disability has a limited capacity to, um, so they can't really enforce expectations or teach rules to the child because they feel like the child may not be able to handle it. So all these types of perceptions are related to efficacy results, uh, excuse me, related to efficacy and they often result in the big picture for the family of less opportunity for kids to learn new skills, less opportunities for parents to try out different intervention strategies that we know could be effective, and also less access to opportunities and participation in a good quality of life. So we thought perhaps if we address some of the attribution styles of parents, of all of us, we could better support families who are kind of stuck in this rut or in this pattern of negative thinking and um, really think about how we could um, do that through our work with behavior parent training. Um, so when we think about perceptions of adults, we also, and parents, we need to think about how does that maintain or make problem behavior um, continue, right, as kids get older. In a study by Duran that was conducted over three years for families of young children with challenging behavior, they looked at a lot of different things and factors that influence parents being able to implement with fidelity. And what they saw, saw that for families that experienced this chronic stress, even with access to good positive behavior supports and good coaching, they could really predict that problem behavior was not necessarily related to the severity of the disability. And it wasn't related really to the severity of the problem behavior. The best predictor of future problem behavior was what they identified as parental pessimism. So what I've been um, describing to you in terms of attribution and how parents' perceptions in, about um, events, how they interpret events, um, both things that are good and, and things that are difficult in their daily activities Talk about that. So let's talk about the three Ps of pessimistic thinking. So we um, decided that we were gonna look at Maricela's model of learned optimism and kind of figure out, can we, can we use some of these uh, strategies or this type of program to determine exactly how can we identify and really come to terms when we're um, doing coaching of um, understanding and getting those red flags when we hear uh, a parent making a pessimistic statement. So there's um, the three Ps and the first one is personalization or locus of control. So that's if a parent 
is expressing that they feel like they can control a situation or that it's out of their control. And this is really a tendency for um, folks to blame themselves despite the existence of other possible factors and contributors. Uh, this type of self-talk really contributes to low self-esteem and negative thinking. The second one is permanence, and that's really the lack of the length of impact, right? So that's kind of what we call a catastrophizing. Um, those are statements where um, folks may interpret and talk about bad things, never stop, and bad things happen all the time, right? So it's always dinner's bad, and it's going to be bad now, and it's going to be bad in the future. And this type of self-talk contributes to giving up and low parent efficacy. And the third one is pervasiveness. So that's where we're looking for statements that again are maybe all or nothing, always or never that you hear at the beginning. And it, it extends to specific situations and the fact that the problem is unsolvable, right? So all aspects are bad, um, this is not gonna change. And this type of self-talk contributes to giving up and negative thinking, right? So let's talk a little bit about when folks are engaging in negative self-talk and making those negative statements, who are they looking at as being responsible for a situation, right? So for uh, a parent that may be blaming themselves, they may pessimistically say, it's my fault that things are going wrong, as opposed to the optimistic thought, I'm doing the best I can under the circumstances, right? So then we think about how do you think of your child in this situation? Well, a pessimistic thought may be, my child's doing it on purpose. Another one could be, you know, my child's incapable of learning or changing because of their disability. My child misbehaves because they're mean or they're bad, or my child's behavior is just beyond their capacity to be able to be taught. And so those are a lot of intense negative self-talk, which of course would get you in this rut. So what, what we would say the inverse of that would be, my child is not intentionally being disruptive or my child can learn. And the last one is the effect of others that may promote negative self-talk. And so others are looking at me, they're looking at my child's behavior at the grocery store when they're having a tantrum, they're judging me, they think I'm a bad parent, right? So all those things may start ruminating in a parent's head. Whereas it, an optimistic thought would be the inverse again of everyone's doing the best they can under the circumstances. We just need to teach. Okay, so that's really where we went from looking at what could we do to support families better? Can we compare it to our traditional providing positive behavior support? And then what were our goals? So we felt that if parents felt more capable and they would have increased levels of persistence, follow through, and confidence. And those are all three things that you need to be able to get through the beginning of starting an intervention, to be able to ha hang in there as you're watching patterns of behavior and being able to change your own behavior as well. We wanted to help parents also recognize that kids can understand expectations. They're able to discriminate across settings. Um, we wanted to reframe parent perception in their efficacy of themselves, that they're a good loving parent who can make a difference. And we also wanted to encourage gratitude and awareness to be able to ce celebrate successes in the child and parent's life. So can we support parents in becoming aware of how they're perceiving events? That's what we did and we, and we really tried. And now I'm gonna talk to you about the nuts and bolts of the procedures that we use as we help to support parents through this additional teaching component. Okay, so as I shared, we had what we called a multiple um, group design. So we had 54 families and they were randomly assigned to one of the two groups, the HELP, which is PBS, or the HOPE, which was PBS and optimism training. And for all the families, one, um, we had a few criteria, but the most important one 
was they had to meet criteria on a assessment of pessimism. So if they didn't score high enough, they couldn't be included in our study. They also had to have a, a kiddo that was between the ages of three and six with an identified disability, as well as severe challenging behavior, such as elopement, self-injurious behavior, aggression, property destruction. And we also asked that they that folks that wanted to participate not have previous parent training so we wouldn't have any um, additional variables that may be influencing our outcomes. Sorry, okay. Um, and so here's how we set it up. So like I said, both groups got the PBS behavior parent training. There was eight one and a half hour sessions that were done weekly with individual families. Uh, we used a standardized manual protocol that the coaches followed. Um, we were uh, responsible for teaching each session content sequentially. Uh, we worked in a facilitated role and we um, had measures that we also collected um, pre post intervention one year two year follow up. And then the PBS was taught through concepts and processes where we had an overview examples application and they could practice. We went through the FBA process and then we developed those package interventions that were function based and individualized based on what the parents wanted. Okay, all right. Um, so then what we did was we embedded the steps for group two, the hope group of optimism training into those weekly sessions, those weekly PBS sessions. And we had um, six steps that we looked at um, and we really tried to help parents to understand and identify situations that triggered negative thinking um, what they were thinking, what their unproductive thought patterns were, um, what were they saying to themselves, help them increase their awareness, um, help them really, this, is, this was huge, help them understand that what they were thinking in terms of their perceptions and how they interpreted events really influenced their actions. So how they responded to behavior problems. And then we looked at um, identifying disputation in which we challenged the parents' beliefs and about whether they're accurate, useful, beneficial. We um, looked at distraction and that's really a ritual thought process in the moment. And then substitution where we help parents develop more productive self-talk. And just a new way of looking at events, changing responses, and all of this again embedded in the PBS training. Um, and just to share with you, this was a handout that we provided for homework for the families, and we would ask them to do this each week. Um, some families, we had to do it during the session itself because it was just too overwhelming for them. But we really wanted them to be able to share difficulty and success that happened at home and what their thoughts and feelings were associated with the event. And then as we went through progressively week by week, we introduced these strategies and then had that. And then throughout the session, we analyzed their self-talk. So if we heard uh, uh, always or never statement, that was our red flag, like, okay, let's probe this one a little bit more. Um, so this was really neat. They could use this kind of as a journal um, and they could kind of keep track and it was part of their homework. And I included an example of a completed version that I won't go through here, but you it's very self-explanatory. So you can look through that and read that um, at your convenience. So um, we have the different steps. And what I'm gonna do now is present those to you, talk about how we use those probe questions to help families and then demonstrate how um, we supported families through this training. All right, so the first one is session one. We looked at identifying situations and beliefs, right? So identifying what were tough situations or events, scenarios that happen that may have triggered negative thinking. So as a coach, I would start asking, okay, so you said the carnival that you went to was really, really difficult. So what exactly was happening? And where were you at the time? Okay, so you brought Danny to the carnival and you were going to get hot dogs. And then... What did your child and others do? Well, Danny ran away across the street and he wouldn't come back and everybody was looking. Okay, so what were you feeling and thinking while this was occurring? And what did you say to yourself? 
And that's how we got through to help them start to become more aware that they were even registering that these events were impacting their um, thoughts and feelings. So I'm going to show you an example right now. And this is Kristen working with, <laughs> excuse me, parents and really looking at how could we identify those situations and beliefs. So they identified a scenario where their dog had been ill. I think they had a bladder infection. And that so they were having these accidents in the house. And mom was describing how her son would run over and jump in those urine puddles and just was having a blast. And she kept saying no and trying to redirect him. And she eventually talks about with uh, Kristen's guidance, how she felt. And then what was she thinking? Right. So it's all about she felt helpless, no control and mad. So I'm going to play that for you right now. Okay. I'm, you know, I'm mad because, you know, my, you know, my dog has got this problem that, you know, that I don't, that for a long time I wasn't able to fix. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we now have our own medication where oh. it helps. What dog do you have? Um, we have a Labrador. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh -huh. But, you know, at the same time, mm -hmm. you know, Andrew would literally just stomp through it So that's a really nice example of how those, you know, thoughts can really be intrusive, right? Overwhelmed. I can't do all this at the same time. And that often leads to just giving in and giving up. So session two, we started, and this is a pivotal session, I think. Um, we started um, going beyond just identifying situations and beliefs and started helping parents to understand the relationship between thoughts and actions or behavior. And the rationale for asking questions about, you know, why are thoughts and feelings important? Um, it's because how we interpret situations around us influences how we perceive life and how we react and behave. And this has been pivotal for me personally as well. So what we think changes what we do, right? And then there's also that aspect that you could kind of look at as functionality, right? So parent behavior could also be viewed with a functional approach that, you know, it's really bad, the tantrum in the store. So we're leaving and we're not getting anything because people are looking at me. And that may be something that reinforces the parent's uh, escape behavior. So what we did was we um, started focusing on why are thoughts and feelings important and how we interpret situations. Um, and then thinking, um, having those probe questions. So what were you thinking when everyone was looking at you and you had, and your daughter had the meltdown? And how did that affect what you did? And what were the results of your actions, both immediate and long-term? So I think the next example is, um, really encompasses all those things. And it's um, regarding um, mom talking to Melissa, moms in the black shirt. And uh, they were a very faith-based family. And, you know, they were very much involved in Sunday school in church, but her son continued to have problem behavior. Um, it became very difficult for mom and you could hear her expressing that she had, you know, immediate response to it of taking away stuff for her son and then long term even considering if going to church is worth it. And I took him to Sunday school and there's a 
portion of where we sit together. And he was just acting up. And I kept saying, Evan, you have to sit there. Yeah, you know, sit quietly. He was he was just he was wiggling in his seat, he was closing the book, he was what else was he? He was just not I think he hit me in the other one too. Because mm -hmm. I told him to sit still and he was like, what? Um so oh so that was okay, so that was the difficulty and mm -hmm. what did I my thought that was going through my mind was, is it worth bringing him? Is it worth ma making him go to Sunday school? Because he doesn't, he wants to go, but he doesn't want to go. It's like one of those, once he's there, he's, once he's there, he has a good time. Mm -hmm. But getting him there isn't, you know, it's. How were you feeling at the time? <sighs> trying to figure out if it was worth having him continue. <laughs> Tired. Mm -hmm. Kind of, luckily people there know him. And they know he acts up, but that behavior with other people kind of get those those looks like. You know, so other people are looking at me sure. and judging. Yes. Mm -hmm. And how? What were what were the consequences of those thoughts? What did you do then? He, that's when he lost his special treat. I said, continue doing this, you're going to lose your special treat. Because I was trying to figure out what to. Mm -hmm. Did he continue the behavior? Yes, which is when he lost his treat. I said, you know, was, I gave him a warning. If you continue doing that, you will lose your special treat. He continued, he lost his treat. Okay. Um, did, after that, did you remove him from the situation? Um, yeah, well, I basically held him down until the end, and the situation ended soon thereafter. Okay. The program was over. Okay. So we heard a lot of things there, you know, church may not be worth it to take him. And also that whole thing about others and judging and how, what an impact that has on families and it may really stop them in their tracks. So those are the kind of things that we're looking at. Okay. So I also wanted to share with you another aspect of recognizing consequences and actions. Um, here's a mom that I worked with, and um, sometimes, uh, like I said, um, folks don't have homework done, they're really stressed out. So we actually walk through that shared difficulty homework activity form, um, and then actually what happened here was the opposite. There was a positive event, a success that happened, and she didn't even recognize it until we talked about it. And, uh you know, as far as, well, let's see, the bathtub was good this week. I only had to give him a bath two times. And he was really good about it. Okay, well, let's use that as a success then. All right, so what happened? He took a bath or? Took, got in the bathtub. Okay. Without too much. <laughs> And what were you thinking when that happened? I was really glad we're starting to get, you know, it's like he loves to swim, so the pool, I don't understand the big thing with him and not listening about the bath, because once he gets in it, of course, I can't get him out. But, um... So you saw him be able to go in? Without too much. Right. And actually, he was ready to get out. Right. Because, you know, I'm coming home at 8, and you think somebody could give him a bath. <laughs> But it's my job, I guess. So your belief was, what were you thinking when you saw that he was doing pretty well in that routine? I probably didn't even notice it until you made me think about it. Okay. Yeah, too busy. Okay. So and I think that, you know, I got to Okay, well, let's think talk. about that. All right, so the what you were interpreting from the situation was you kind of didn't you process were. it because you were too busy. Right. I didn't okay. even profit that it was a good situation. Okay, so go ahead and write that down. And as
as a result of you being really busy and you know, as you look back on it, you you can think, wow, that was pretty I good. Didn't even reward him. Right. Okay. Exactly. So the consequences of not being able to pick up on that was that you didn't reward him. Okay. Go ahead and write that down because that's kind of getting back to what we're going to talk about today. So that was a real epiphany for her, and I really saw. Um, a big change in her uh, ability to start recognizing the successes of her son from that week on, and that was just week two. Um, so the next session we talk about, and we start um, helping parents to understand the process of disputation. And that's really kind of challenging those negative or inaccurate thought patterns and recognizing how they can have a detrimental effect on actions and outcomes. You know, often we accept our thoughts at face value, even though those beliefs may have little or no foundation. So disputation helps families to assess the truth and the value of existing thoughts. And the process we use is we guide the family to start arguing or challenging their own beliefs. And we use a four-step process. So the first step is we help them identify the negative belief. And then we ask them, what did you say to yourself? We have them list evidence that supports that negative belief. What makes you believe that to be true? And then step three is where we start that pushback, right? And find alternative explanations for the problem. Are there other possible reasons or motives? You know, maybe in the um, situation at Sunday school, that little guy just didn't have the skills or maybe it was too long or maybe they needed, he needed some visuals of first then, right? So it may be, other factors that are contributing to the problem behavior. And then number four, evaluating the usefulness of maintaining that belief. Is it helpful for you? Does it benefit your situation, right? So this video that I'm gonna share with you now is Laura um, talking with a mom who is uh, sharing experience of visiting her dad's house with her kids and she really starts to um, address some of the negative thought patterns about what happens. And Laura guides her to question some of her negative thoughts. What you're saying is, I have no control. Yeah. So that's what's going through your head is, I have no, no control. control. I mean, cause that's what you like point blank said to me. Right. So it obviously had to be going on right. up here as well. Uh, yeah. So let's take a look at that. The, the statement, I have no control. Okay. Is that belief true? that you have absolutely no control. No. No, it is not. Because you were able to take control by saying, okay, we are leaving. Yeah. So you do have control. Um, are there other explanations? I was thinking the house wasn't friendly. <laughs> okay. The house wasn't so the house wasn't kid friendly. Um, were there clear rules reviewed with them prior to going inside? So maybe they didn't know what the expectations were, True. even though you said stay in the room, mm -hmm. you know, that type of thing. So there's other explanations that right. could to account. And when they've gone there in the past, have they done it before? Yes. Okay. So <laughs> the past, they have some past history of learning, and we get away with it for a certain amount of time, and then we leave. Yeah. Oh, that's true. I believe. <laughs> Um, are the beliefs beneficial? No. Did it help you to say, I have no control? No. Did it make your visit more enjoyable for you to be thinking that you have no control? No, because I got no. flustered hot flashes and I just wanted to get hell out of it. Exactly. <laughs> and, and like you said, you're like, then I can't even visit with my dad. Right? Okay. So then the, the session four, we look at the ritual of distraction. And so that's when you're in the moment, there's a tantrum occurring and you start ruminating with those pessimistic thoughts to be able to stop them in the moment, right? And then be able to reflect later on what the scenario was. So we have um, the rationale that we use is it may not be possible to dispute thoughts in the moment, right? And this really allows parents to set aside that pessimistic thinking temporarily. So we have them come up with some kind of ritual that kind of interrupts that pattern of thinking. And I had a mom that like would hold her locket when she started feeling like, oh, I'm overwhelmed. The kids are, are um, you know, we're gonna get in trouble and I'm a terrible parent. 
And so it's just something where they can stop and then start thinking about how that, how that thinking was productive or unproductive later on. So here again is Laura and the mom talking about what they might use for an distraction in the moment with her two young boys. Next time it happens, I'll think, try to think of something. Well, we're gonna come up oh, with something today. today. Oh, okay. We're gonna come up with something today. It can change, but I want you to come up with something today and then we're gonna jot it on the homework. Okay. So you have it in writing that when this occurs, you know, when the negative thoughts start happening, I'm gonna say this. Whether, you know, it's yippee ki -yay. <laughs> That's fine. I mean, seriously, that's fine. Whatever it is. I don't want to say that. Next time it happens, I'll think try to Okay, so um, any of you folks of a certain age out there might know that movie with Bruce Willis from Die Hard. And that was what her and her husband used together to try to tag team. So when things really got out of control, when they were driving in the car, they would say yippee ki -yo, and that would kind of refocus them. Session five, we start looking at introducing the process of substitution, and that's really substituting negative or inaccurate beliefs with affirmations. And the rationale for this is because we can replace negative ideas with positive thoughts or affirmations, and it encourages and allows a parent to take active control over their negative thoughts, um, activate those positive thoughts instead of simply accepting the negative thinking that's been imprinted through our past experiences, and it allows a parent to be more effective when responding to the child's behavior. So an example, this is a difficult situation. I'm handling it well. I'm a committed, loving parent, and if I can follow through with my plan, things are going to get better. So probes that we would ask the family as they're starting, we're starting to collaborate and develop the um, substitution process. What could you say to yourself in this situation that would make you feel better about yourself as a parent? Allow you to control your emotions and reactions, manage your child's behavior more effectively, see your child in a more positive light, encourage yourself to follow through, right? Going back to that implementation fidelity and make you feel more empowered and accepting that confidence. So when we develop affirmation statements. We want parents to be able to state them in the present tense. I'm a good parent. I'm going to follow through with my plan. Focus on solutions. Be specific and comprehensive and honest and practical. So again, the parents guide, uh, excuse me, the therapist collaborate and guide the parents to identify those substitutions by using tools such as questioning, reframing, positioning and mirroring to support that identification process. And um, this is a really lovely video with Mimi and a mom who they are working on reframing and mom is feeling more successful and she's sharing about how she's feeling more in control and more capable. She had a, a young child who was, um, was nonverbal and extremely aggressive, and she was really working on helping her develop independent living skills and being able to feed herself. So it was a challenging situation. Uh, so I, you, I, stuck I, I stuck to your gun. I stuck to my gun. And you either going to talk to and me? And she, she, there was another day she cried, and she was crying. She got upset. I said, don't, don't hug. She tried to give me a hug. Don't touch me. Don't come hug it on me. Mm -hmm. And I was real firm, and I looked at her like this and bucked my eye. Don't, don't, uh -uh. don't touch me. Not don't when you're going to hit. Not right? when you're going to hit. Now, bite and fight and hit. I said, if you don't be nice, then you get your hugs. If you be mean, you won't get them. Okay. Oh, she looked at me and smiled. I said, you're going to be nice. She looked at me and smiled. So I gave her a hug. I said, be nice. You get your hugs. Be mean. You won't get them. How'd you feel? Now she's, uh, when that was going I on. I felt like I was in control of her. Like she wasn't over attacking me, like I was like able to control her, you know, and be the big, I'm the big one now. <laughs> I like the little one. So I'm house. in charge, huh? Right, I'm in charge of things, you know, I felt like I was in charge and stuff. And um, I was happy because I told her, if, you know, if you're not going to get this, then <laughs> 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 So you can see how um, Mimi helped her to reframe it and how um, mom was really feeling more confident. So set, um, session six and seven, we really did a lot of practice on those steps that I described. And we looked at um, practicing the optimism process and cognitive restructuring. So sometimes parents weren't really comfortable with this new way of thinking. 
and they still had the history, but they weren't really comfortable with that. So we really helped them and supported them during those two sessions. And then in session eight, we talked about evaluating and maintaining the positive self-talk once the formal sessions stop. So we wanted to guide parents to create and develop effective ways to monitor their own behavior in this new way of thinking. Um, we looked at helping parents to identify what are the common themes that they may be having problems with in terms of, again, that negative self-talk, what works and what doesn't. We know nothing works 100% of the time. We all fall into those ruts or have a bad day, but what can you do the next time? So I want to share with you another family that I worked with, and they're just talking about, they're at the last session, and talking about um, what they've gained from learning these strategies of optimism training. And um, they had an issue where they felt that their son was being intentionally disrespectful with his problem behavior. So you can really hear how they have changed their um, way of looking at the relationship. The team and the biggest thing was just letting it go was our hardest part was after the incident might happen, we we're just too angry with him. Even though he's all over it and like coming up and huggy kissy and you know talking to us, we were still holding on to that anger. And I think that had to be the biggest part that we had to overcome. And I think we finally got to that point because when we've had our incident, you know what, you need to go in your room. Just and, you know, and I'm not going to say that every single time because it's still... Right, of course, not, it's, yeah. that's just a learning curve for us. And you know what? We've come a long way. <laughs> so, it's a lot of work to, to change how you interact mm -hmm. and, and to pull back. How, how do you feel now that it's more that you can be objective and be like, you know what, this isn't really directed towards me or I'm going to get over this or I'm not going to hold on to it? How, is it? How does it feel different? Mm -hmm. And it feels good to know that we can be able to, you know, do things like a family. As a matter of fact, we met, or we went to my mom's house this Friday, and they, my kids met my cousin that I hadn't seen in a while, and oh, their kids, kids, and oh my gosh, they have a child that's going to be five in October that just... Dang, an angel. <laughs> Dang, wow. Moms, we came to you with that when... Yeah and nothing compared to what this little boy was. And to see them interact was, you know, we kind of sit back and went, <laughs> we're not there anymore. Uh, but, you know, and, and we were able to, you know, I mean, his kids are going to act like kids and when they're oh, yeah. playing and whatever. Right. But we were able to give, you know, even in, in that situation, a few verbal cues to get Danny back focused where he needed to be. Because a couple of times he got way out of hand with him because the other one was so wound up. When you calm down, you know, we need to. Okay, so that, um, I thought that was a, a really insightful viewpoint that parents had. Um, the last thing I want to share is just some of the outcomes from our study. We did a lot of qualitative and quantitative analysis. If you're interested in that, I can share the article with you. But basically what we saw is following the intervention of um, both behavior parent trainings, that child behavior improved, that families in the optimism group completed eight sessions in a shorter number of weeks than those just receiving PBS training, and that those in the optimism group reported additional feelings and statements that were not reported by the PBS group. They were more hopeful about their child's future. They felt more in control. They were less tense when taking their child out in public. They were less likely to avoid taking their child out in public. And they really felt like their family was able to do the same kind of things as other families. So I'm gonna turn it over now and say, thank you so much for listening and um, go from there and um, see if there's any discussion or questions. There are some questions and we only have a tiny bit of time. Here's one logistic one. So how frequent were the sessions? Were they once a week, every couple of weeks? And did you have to adjust? Could family say, I can't come this week, but I'll come next? Or how'd you deal with that? Absolutely. We, we accommodated the family schedule. Um, we did try to hold it weekly because some of the training and the optimism is kind of in, intensive. Um, and plus, we want to keep that rapport in place because this is delicate stuff to 
to discuss with folks. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then of course they could reschedule. And we did have some families that um, we saw a little bit of attrition, but again, those in the optimism training were um, so involved and so excited about coming every week. That's wonderful. And then we noticed there were dads in the videos. And then our last last one, the dad talked a lot, but so kind of was there one parent who kind of was targeted as the main person or how'd that, how'd you navigate that? Yeah, that's a really good question. We did have, you know, we had um, very diverse families, um, lifestyles, uh, social economic income, education. And so, you know, we just individualized it. If both family members came, then both family members learned how to do implementation of PBS as well as the self-talk. Now, sometimes it was hard because there may be someone who's a little more talkative than the other. So we kind of had to walk on that tightrope about making sure that we got the perspectives of everyone that attended our sessions. That's terrific. Um, had, did you encounter any families that were struggling with any of their own health challenges or mental cha mental health challenges and um, how do you navigate that I guess mm. yeah that's a really good question um yeah so um the last family I worked with they had some severe uh dad had some um health issues going on during that time um we did have a, another family that I worked with that I shared um had a um a sibling that passed during the time. So there was, you know, additional life stressors that were occurring for folks. Um, there were also um, families, uh, parents that came in that were um, from uh, culturally diverse and immigrants. So really kind of adjusting our style to uh, even eye contact and how we connected, how we built rapport it was a great learning experience for me personally. That's great. All right. Well, so thank you so much. Everybody loved this and lots of uh, comments in there. People interested in getting the book. Someone wants to know PMI will do train the trainers. And, you know, I think this is so valuable. And I think there's all kinds of implications for all of the work we do, not only with families, but also with direct care staff. So thank you for this really great presentation, Shelly. Uh, Victor's going to walk us through kind of um, what's next? Shelly has put in the slide deck where you can get the manuals because this is manualized, as well as the optimistic parenting book, which I think everybody ought to read who works with children and families. So thank you so very much to all of our panelists for the wonderful insights. Your feedback is very important to the work that we do. Please remember to provide your feedback on this webinar with our post webinar survey by typing the web address shown on this slide into your internet browser or scan the QR code. Your certificate of attendance will appear once you submit the survey. We invite you to visit our website, challengingbehavior.org, to sign up for our upcoming webinars, access recordings, download pyramid model resources, and more. Thank you to our funder for making this webinar possible. This concludes our webinar. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day.